Good morning. It is Steve from Southern Illinois. And it's so good to be with you today. Um, as you can see, spring has progressed to the green stage. I love it when, when I'm driving down the road, the woods are just painted with different hues of green. Um, and today when I stepped outside to, uh, to meet with you, uh, there was a ruby-throated hummingbird sunning itself on my deck, just all spread out, soaking up the rays. <laughs> it's a beautiful time of year. So we're trying a little bit of a different setting today to try to avoid the breeze, which uh, I notice has been causing some static in the microphone. But that's what's going on here. Roger Tory Peterson. You may not know that name, but he transformed the experience of amateur bird watching with his field guides. Uh, he was an ornithologist, a, a scientist who studies birds, but he was challenged to write a field guide that would be accessible and usable to common everybody, everyday people. Before Roger Tory Peterson uh, tackled this job, the bird guides were unintelligible. I've tried to read them, okay? You had to know the technical language, and there were no pictures. It was just these dry, detailed, precise des uh, descriptions. <clears throat> They're boring. But Roger Tory Peters, he produced field guides that focused in on key characteristics of each bird, and there was pictures that had these lines that I pointed you right to the the uh, characteristic that you needed to look for, okay? And in my family growing up, we were never far from one of his field guides. Uh, there was one on our family bookshelf. There were children's versions on the bookshelves that my father built for my brother and I, because my parents believed that if children had books, they would read them. And they invested heavily, I'm not saying lots of money, but in terms of time and effort and attention, this was a priority for them. <clears throat> and when we traveled on vacations, okay, we, this stage in my childhood that I'm talking about right now, we lived in New Mexico, but we had family in California and in Iowa. And every summer we did the circuit to visit family and stay connected. And as we were traveling, there was always a Roger Tory Peterson field guide with us. And um, my brother and I, <laughs> it was our entertainment, okay? We would sit there for hours poring over the books and, <coughs> you know, I would cover the, the name of the bird and have my brother try to identify the bird just from the picture or he would sit over in the corner so I couldn't see the book and he would call out the key characteristics of the bird and I was supposed to identify it just on the characteristics and we would play name that bird with my mother as we were driving along and she she'd point out birds on the uh, at, uh, the roadside it was birds were a big thing in my family okay uh, and certain birds had a romance about them, you know. I'll never forget the first time I saw stellar jays up in the mountains in California. Oh, man, I recognize them! Or my mom's squeal of delight the first time that she saw, I'm going to have to look at it because I always get this wrong, a Thana pepla. Faina Pepla. Have you ever seen a Faina Pepla? Well, you don't live in the, the great American Southwest then. It's a, it's a bird. It kind of looks like a cardinal, but the males are a glossy, iridescent black. And they're, they're, they're called silky flycatchers. And my mother had wanted to see one for a long time, and she was just absolutely thrilled. And she squealed so loud that my dad almost had a wreck driving off the road because he was so startled. Or counting scissor-tailed 
flycatchers as we drove through Oklahoma. Oh man, you wouldn't believe how many scissor tail flycatchers there were. So, and or having my mom point out the difference between a turkey vulture and a red-tailed hawk when it's soaring way up in the air. You can't see the red on the tail, but this just by the silhouette, we could recognize turkey vulture, red-tailed hawk. But there was one bird that entranced my brother and I more than any others. The ivory-billed woodpecker. Ever seen one? I didn't think so. Okay, these were the largest woodpeckers in North America, almost the largest in the world. Okay, they're bigger than crows. Okay, the from head to tail, from bill to tail, they're 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 up to 20 inches, and they have a wingspan of two and a half feet. I mean, when a ivory-billed woodpecker through the woods flew through the woods, it was like this presence coming, or at least that's the way my brother and I envisioned it, okay, because um, when we were children, the last known sighting of an ivory-billed woodpecker had been in the swamps of Louisiana in 1944, more than two decades earlier, and they were deemed extinct. But of course, that presented a challenge to these two young explorers in the back seat as we were traveling. Nobody has seen an ivory-billed woodpecker. Maybe we will see one and bring them back from extinction. So, as we were traveling through the mountains of California, our eyes were peeled for ivory-billed woodpeckers. My mother just laughed. Boys, they were seen in Louisiana. But that didn't give us pause in the least. We immediately replied, yes, but who knows if they've moved? We cut down the forest in Louisiana, but look at all the trees around here. Maybe they moved here. And so we had our eyes peeled every place we went, looking for ivory-billed woodpeckers that had found a new home. My mom loved us. And we loved ivory-billed woodpeckers. But we never saw one. We never saw an ivory-billed woodpecker until one day in 1975. Yes, that's right. Pet rocks and ivory-billed woodpeckers. I was sitting in my college Biology 101 class. Now, if any of you have taken Biology 101, you know that it is one of the most thrilling classes. It goes through some generalities of, of biology, and then for the rest of the year, you go over all of the different classifications of living organisms known to man. Ugh. I was bored out of my goal. This is in the days before PowerPoint or projectors. Uh, you just had the professor sitting at the front of the class with his notes droning on and on, describing these creatures that we were probably never going to see, and very few of us cared anything about. I mean, I love biology. I love nature. I, I love learning about things, but I was bored out of my gall. So, so you, you can understand how the rest of the class was. So I was desperately trying to not snore in class because the teacher was quite persnickety, okay? If you made noise while he was talking, there were consequences, and the consequences were known to be uh, even more boring. For example, he had one student create a list of all the lizards living in the mountains of Arizona and present it to the class. 
Okay, that's just an example of some of the disciplinary actions. And we, we learned very quickly, you do not snore in class, you do not speak in class, you do not peep in class. So I was desperately trying to stay awake. And I noticed down the north side of the classroom was this huge glassed-in display case with these stuff animals and birds. They weren't stuffed very well. It's kind of amateur job of taxidermy in my opinion because I recognized some of them and they didn't look at all lifelike. But in desperation I started at the far end of the classroom trying to identify each specimen. I was far enough away I, I couldn't really see most of the labels. So at the end of class then I would go up and check my results. And during class I would choose one of them and I, I would think and I would try to identify it and then I would try to remember, okay, where does it live? What does it eat? Are there any other details that it might be interesting? Um, yeah, I was pretty bored. By the time we were halfway through the year, okay, I was halfway through the display case. And pretty soon, I was having to crook my neck around to see the object of my day's distraction. And one day, my head was crooked around when suddenly, I did a double take. Because there was a bird there, and I knew I'd never seen it before. It was a big bird, black, with a woodpecker's bill. Now, woodpeckers were pretty important to my brother and I. My mother called us hard-headed, but let me tell you, woodpeckers take the cake, okay? Because they can bang their head against wood for hours on end and never get a headache. So when my mother would accuse us of being hard-headed, we would just, we had a ready comeback. We're not woodpeckers, Mom. But there was a big black woodpecker sitting there. And it had a crest on its head. Now, here in the United States, we have big black woodpeckers. They're called pileated woodpeckers. Um, not quite as big as a crow. Um, this, they also have a crest on their head. But their crest is red in both the males and females, and this woodpecker had a black crest, not a pileated. And then I noticed that down, starting, starting right at the, the angle of the head and going down the neck and onto the back was a white stripe. Now, pileated, the white stripe starts at the beak and there are actually two of them. One goes through the cheek like this, and the other one goes up the bottom of the jaw. And then they join, but they end as the neck joins the back. This was not a pileated woodpecker. What kind of woodpecker was it? And then I noticed that the beak, instead of being dark gray like a pileated woodpecker's, it was white. All of a sudden, it dawned on me. I was looking at an ivory-billed woodpecker. And right there in class, where I'm supposed to be maintaining the silence of the tomb, I blurt out loudly, That's a red of ivory-billed woodpecker! And every head in the class whipped around there was dead silence, even the professor was not talking now, and every eye in the classroom was focused on little me. And finally somebody said, What? I said, That's an ivory-billed woodpecker! <laughs> and one of my fellow classmates said, So what? I said, You don't understand. They've been extinct for almost 30, at least 30 years, and nobody's seen any, but there's one right there. Oh, 
the yawns started and people started turning around. And I said, but, but, and I, I looked at the professor with appealing eyes and he said, um, that's enough. And he looked at his seating chart. He didn't know me from Adam. He looked at his seating chart. Steve Scott, is it? Yes. See me after class. And that got chuckles from my classmates. Oh, I was humiliated. But there was a ivory-billed woodpecker sitting right there. <sighs> Finally, class came to an end, and I waited until everybody else filed out of the room. And believe me, some of them were hanging back to see what would happen to the unlucky student. But I waited until everybody else was gone, and then I timidly approached the professor. And he just picked up his books and his papers, and he said, follow me. And he led me into his office, and he shut the door. And before he even sat down, he said, nothing that I say can leave this room. Well, he's dead and gone, so I'm telling you the story, okay? Turned out that a decade before, he had taken a group of students on an ornithology expedition to Mexico. They, had a, they were collecting bird specimens to bring back for the college display. And one of the students saw this huge black bird flying through the woods and blam! And down fell an ivory-billed woodpecker. Now they had a license to collect bird specimens. But he was sure that did not cover killing the first representative of a species deemed extinct for over two decades. What do you do? Some of the, uh, the uh, adults on the team said, oh, we don't want to get in trouble. And so they were all for burying it out in the woods. And he said, no, this... This is, this is a, this is history. This is, this is so important. We can't just bury it. And so he smuggled it back into the United States in his luggage, risked, <laughs> who knows what, and there it sat. There was no label on it saying ivory-billed woodpecker because he didn't want to call attention to the fact of, how it came to be there. And that is how Steve discovered the last verified sighting of an ivory-billed woodpecker. One of the touchstones of the spiritual, the meaningful life uh, that we find in the lives of people and the men and women in the Bible is the concept of God as our Father. In Genesis, he's not talked about as our Father. Uh, he's frequently referred to as the God of your fathers. Okay, I, Who are you? I'm the God of your fathers. I'm the God your father knew. But in Exodus, in his first conversation with Moses, he declares, Israel is my son, and I am his father. He declared himself our father. And that theme is, develops further throughout the Old Testament. In Deuteronomy, uh, Moses describes God this way, the father who redeemed you from Egypt the Father who has made you, the people you are, who's established you and given you security. In 1 Chronicles 29.10, uh, David is praying a prayer of dedication of all of the materials that he's gathered to, to leave to his son to build the temple. And, and he is the first one to address God in prayer as our Father. Jeremiah and Malachi, prophets in the Old Testament, both used the imagery of God as our Father to drive home the message that they were trying to communicate. 
And then when we get to the New Testament, I mean, it's all over the place. My Father, your Father, our Father, the Father, the Father, God the Father, is at the center of the New Testament picture of reality. And it's at the center of the spiritual lives of the men and women living there. God is not only personal, he's not only compassionate, he is everything a father should be. Which brings us to a major problem. A lot of us didn't have fathers who were what they should be. Some of them abused us. Mentally, physically, emotionally, sexually. What if father has traumatic associations for us? And it turns out that for more than half of us, and that means many of you, that father, father memories are not positive. And I've heard many people say, I can't relate to God as my father. My father was horrible, and just the very thought of God of being my father makes me cringe. Today, we, uh, we recognize how powerful these effects can be, okay? Traumatic events in the past create a lens through which we see not only the past, but the present and the future. They change our emotional responses. They change our mental processes. They even predict our health decades into our lives. How do we deal with this? Well, in Western culture today, we are taught uh, to avoid triggers to traumatic, stressful reactions to trauma. So certain words are not supposed to be used without attaching a warning. Certain topics aren't to be discussed without attaching a trigger warning. So people who have had traumatic experiences associated with that topic or that word um, can choose to, I'm not sure what choice they have. That maybe clinch, that clinch themselves or stiff their fingers in their ears. Okay, it's really controversial about whether trigger warnings are even beneficial. And I'm not talking controversial politically. I'm talking controversial among academics as to whether this is really a path we should go down. To, down. But at the same time, if I know that a, a memory is traumatic for you, I shouldn't go flaunting it. So how can we as Christians talk about God as father when we know that more than half of the population has these traumatic associations. How can we embrace this touchstone of God our Father if we have those associations? I had dreamed all my life of seeing a, re a ivory billed woodpecker. It didn't ma matter that I had never seen one before. It didn't matter that I'd only seen pictures and descriptions. When I was exposed to that ivory billed woodpecker, I recognized it because I had dreamed of seeing it all my life. Those of us who have traumatic associations with the word father, who have fathers who were imperfect with a capital A I M P E R F, we know they were imperfect because we have in our mind an idea, a description, an ideal of what a father really should be. Our father was not that way, but this is what he should have been. 
and we have longed for that father all of our lives it is that longing that keeps abused people coming back and trying to fix the relationship with their abuser if you've longed for something your entire life why would you reject it when you see it God is not abusive he is not cruel the God that Jesus introduced us to is a God that loves us and cares for us who opens his arms to us in an open embrace when we take the first step towards him he is not our enemy And that is another touchstone. It is the touchstone at the center of the men, the, the spiritual lives of the men and women in the New Testament. Will you risk letting that kind of father into your life? Will you take the risk of embracing this touchstone? Of letting him enfold you in his love? It took me a long time to take that risk, friends. But it has been such a powerful factor in my spiritual life. It gives me peace. It gives me confidence. It gives me hope and darkness. It, it keeps despair at bay. So I invite you, test this touchstone. Embrace it. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.